right, there we go. Hi, hey everyone. Richard Carlton here. Welcome to another great day of FileMaker training at fmtraining.tv. I'm the creator of fmtraining.tv where you can learn all about the FileMaker platform and learn how to build better FileMaker applications for you, your customers, your organization. This broadcast is completely free to everyone and is being broadcast in high definition to Discord, YouTube, and to Twitch. This broadcast is being recorded, which is really great. Of course, we might clean up the recording a little bit. So if we make a malfunction during the live stream, then of course we reserve the right to clean that up on the recording later on. However, because it's a live broadcast, we encourage you to ask questions. In fact, some people get aggravated when there's this dialogue with you and we ask questions. I, I, we want questions. If you have a question, odds are other people have the question too. And so I want to thank everyone for logging in, Ken and TK and Dave, Dave One, Dave Learning, uh, Ed, uh, Elzo, uh, Carol, Jake, Mike, all of you, welcome once again to another great broadcast. Now, as a reminder, if you want to check out the upcoming broadcast, go to fmtraining.tv, press the left tab for the live button. You can see the upcoming broadcast schedule. That's pretty awesome. Additionally, if you want to help support this channel, right? We always say this, uh, this broadcast is brought to you by fmtraining.tv, bringing you the greatest and the most entertaining FileMaker training videos available. So the idea is that if you want to help support the channel, make sure you check out our on-demand video bundles. We have videos that cover the latest version of FileMaker, we have videos that cover the deploy course. In fact, we used to sell the courses individually anymore. It's just much simpler to sell a complete bundle for a low price. We do this on an annual basis. So if you buy one of the bundles that really helps support the channel, it ensures that we can keep coming back every day because this broadcast actually takes a lot of money to run. The people here don't work for free. Hi, I'm Richard, and we're searching for gold coins. And why are we searching for gold coins? Because FileMaker, Claris, used to be called FileMaker. The people there created some really neat products, and a neat product, and they made some neat uh, additions in it, and they really didn't tell anyone. If you look at size 9 font in the README document, there's this little tiny bit about this like obscure thing that's in there, and everyone's like, yeah, whatever. Whatever, right? So, uh, but we uh, we decided it was kind of a big deal. It's like the hidden gold coin. So that was the idea of what we were doing. We were doing the uh, hidden gold coin action. And so we were going to be talking about that with Christian Olson today. It's very exciting. And that's what he was digging for with his dog out in the desert, right? Pretty good footage. It worked out okay, right? So that's the whole idea. So real quick, upcoming broadcast schedule for those of you wondering what's going on. So today is gold coins. Tomorrow is going to be... Uh, kind of a conversation about uh, performance. It's for those of you who um, will take performance questions along the way. It's kind of more of a basic intermediate conversation. Um, we've reshot our performance videos in our Pro 19 slash Pro FileMaker 20, whatever the hell they're calling it now. Um, we've yet to be told what they're going to call it. Maybe Christian Schmidt knows what they're going to call it. Um, I have official requests in and people are like, uh, this, is, this is what I got told by Claris, right? <clears throat> Richard, you've got this secret once you know. We're, we're going to announce what we're going to call it when it ships. And I'm like, wait a minute. So anyways, those of you wondering what's going on, no one knows, right? Um, it's a it's a super secret, triple secret uh, plan that they have in May to change the name or number of the product to do whatever they're going to do. So uh, that's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Are more additional days. I'll be covering Anchor Buoy day one, day two, uh, Wednesday, Thursday. That's for people who are confused by Anchor Buoy. So if you know people who are confused by Anchor Buoy, we get people who are like, I'm confused. I don't understand. We're going to take it very slow, step by step. Okay, very, very, very important. We're going to be covering that. 
And then Friday, Jacob Taylor, we're going to be covering remote distance FileMaker server updates. He will be on with me. So for those of you who are also partaking in our Neomorphism training, that will also be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday uh, at 11 a.m. You've got the invite on that already. If you want to be included in that um, and you feel like you're being left out, um, just come over here to the website, FM Neomorphism, and uh, go ahead and sign up down there. It's not a free session. The free There's free, and then there's paid training. There's two simultaneous trainings going on during the day. So this is Christian here. Welcome, Christian, once again. Hi, buddy. So are we ready to talk about FileMaker 19.2.2, and what is it, and why do I care, right? So tell us, what is the scoop with this product? No. So I want to start off with uh, with just diving into what Claris gave us and what's on the surface, and then we're gonna we're gonna dig a little bit deeper to get to the gold coins. So Jacob went over nineteen dot two dot two in one of our recent videos, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not sure if he covered these functions, but we're gonna we're gonna start with those, explain what they're for, and like I say, dig dig a little bit deeper. So I'm just gonna actually pull up Claris's boring. Uh, well, that's not so boring, but they're read me here, and we have this new function here called. Well, get layout but we have to we would like that we would like to see what you're reading unless oh i'm not sharing my screen anymore we're just looking at your face it's your face is so beautiful i figured you guys could just read it through my eyes there we go (laughs) all right perfect thank you for uh for letting me know there so so get layout object owner info this is this new function we're going to dive into what it means a little bit but i want to give a little backstory because claris did give us something I just, as I started to explore, and we're going to go through the exact process I did, felt that there was more going on here than met the eyes. So Claris is actively engaged in improving the add-on features uh, in the, 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 the pr- uh, platform, as you all know. And one of my little specialties is knowing a lot about these. And so several weeks ago, um, I noticed that we had some new functions, including this one. I'm like, oh, I need to figure out how this works. Now, for those of you who are at the how to build add-ons, Maybe you came here to build the box with me. Uh, you might remember that you build this payload, the special layout where you drag and drop an object or drag and drop your add-on into the uh, the target file. And what Claris wants to do is they want to expand uh, for us the, uh, the abilities to maybe find that object, associate information with it, and, and basically give add-on developers uh, new tools. They, they want to grow this. And so... That's what this get layout object owner info is. It is specifically designed to try to get info maybe out of that object. And more specifically for these JavaScript developers, uh, they need to be able to know about that web viewer they made. And here's how the function works. Uh, you, it's called get layout object owner info, and it has a parameter of object ID. And so I read this and I was like, well, that's interesting. How do you get an object ID? I, that's something that I'm kind of interested in. So I read a little bit further, and what do you know? Somewhere down here, da 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 da. We're going to come back to that. There should be a link. I don't see where it is, but somewhere down here is another function that we're going to hop over to, called it's right layout here. object go, UUI. Go down a little bit. It's down. It's oh. no no. You're you you hold. Oh, there it is. Perfect. I knew that I found it on here somewhere. So uh, yeah. So there's this new other function. So we came over here. And I had to read this and it was like, returns the universally unique identifier, UUID, of the layout object in which the calculation is defined. Huh. This, this seemed interesting. And then I read a little bit more information. We're going we're gonna to pause right there for a moment. I'm going to knock this off screen. And for everybody, let me bring this one over here. We are about to go off the beaten path. To be more specific... If I can undo that, we are going to enter the outer limits of FileMaker. So we have, we're about to leave the document. Cue up cue little music there. So we're about to leave uh, where FileMaker or where Claris documents this for us. Kyle Kyle just pointed out something in Discord that's really great is that the the layout uh, objects in FileMaker have all along had this ID, but we haven't had access to it. And if you've watched any of my previous streams, I'm very particular about trying to get the underlying hidden object, or not object, IDs in FileMaker. That could be a script ID. I'm glad Christian Smith is here because uh, his plugin actually makes it so much easier to be able to find that. Same thing with the layout IDs, really useful. So in the same way that when we're building databases, 
we don't want to refer to a contact by their name. We want to refer to it by their ID. It's a more consistent, accurate, reliable way of finding a record. And for me, it's also a more accurate, reliable, consistent way of finding the elements of the database. But one of the last places that we have not had access to this is our layout objects. So when I saw that there's this function to get an ID, this really piqued my interest. Now, what I didn't show you in the readme is Claris is very particular. This only works for web viewers. Um, but I read that, and to me, that was a challenge. Because if they give us a function that lets us get the UUIDs, I'm guessing that there's a way to, to use that in, in undocumented ways. And I really have to preface this. Don't walk away from this stream and decide that you're going to change all of your coding behavior over what I show you. But what we can hope is that Claris hears the interest from those of us who are like this, and they can realize the potential of this feature. So I'm going to pull over a FileMaker file here for a moment. And we're going to start to kind of walk through these new functions and what they do for us. And so what I have on screen here is a simple button bar. On the right, I've got a name in there like you might normally give to the uh, the button segment. But on the left, you're going to notice that I have this long UUID number. So let's go into layout mode and see what's going on here. So if I double click on this, in the calculation engine, I'm able to go ahead and use that new function, layout object UUID. So this was experiment number one. What happens when I put this into the calculation engine? And if we go ahead and cancel this and we go back to browse mode, you'll see that I've now got that ID number. So that started to pique my interest. If we can now get the ID out of these different objects, could we potentially put that into the other function to get attributes of those objects? And so that's what I did. And Richard, at any point, if you need to interrupt me to ask a question or if there's general questions, please do. Well, Tawa, I just was very bummed that you weren't showing anything because your blue screen was up there for a long time. I figured they were getting kind of bored, so I had to, I had to pull something up. Yeah, so. I know. There you go. So there we go. Okay. So there's a, there's a lot going on here, and I want to unpack it a little bit, and then we're going to dive into, like, why this matters. Because I've shown this to a variety of developers, and I've had interest level of who cares to, oh, wow, this has been missing from the, the platform. To quote, to quote Calvin, only for forever. He's only been asking this feature since he started in the uh, the community. Yeah, he's, and Calvin's been working for us for 15 years. He's been asking for this for 15 years, and he finally gets it. So yes. yeah, even though Claris didn't actually give it to us, <laughs> um, they they and they are they're helping out the the out on developers. I just don't think that they've realized how this could be so useful to to others. That or I'm completely amiss, and it only matters to like me, Kyle, and Calvin, and and no one else cares. <laughs> But what I have up here is, again, just kind of displaying that we're able to pull the ID out of these various layout objects. And I'm going to show some of the ways that I do that. And over on the right here, this is what happens if you plug a UUID into the other function. So let me see if I can look at that here and show everybody uh, in the data viewer what's going on. Oh, yeah, I like to do that. Okay, let me close this file and reopen it real quick. When you start hacking the files a little bit, sometimes you get some weird behavior. Okay. We'll go ahead and close that. We'll clean up the desktop because ugh, in this higher resolution, it's kind of awful looking. Okay. Let's see if I can click on that. There we go. Okay, so if you guys can see my screen, I just want you to kind of focus right here for a moment. Yeah, it looks pretty get good here, I think. You guys good up there? Perf perfect. So get layout object owner info, and it's in a let statement, but this, this function can really go directly into here because the, the, the two sides of this are, number one, getting the UUID out of the object, and the second one is plugging the UUID into this new function called get layout object owner info, okay? And what's tricky about this is we don't necessarily have like these built-in tools into the platform to grab object IDs and display them. So you have to have some tricks in, in your, uh, uh, your, your toolbox, if you will, uh, to use this. And so what I'm doing is a hide calculation because it's on the object so it can self-evaluate. So it self-evaluates to get its own UUID and then I plug that into the function and then I'm displaying it as a variable. This is a little bit of trickery. Okay, hold on, hold on, okay. before you jump, before you jump. Uh -huh. uh, Monkey Bread Boy says that he you should uh, change the 
you guys should change the font size and MBF preferences dialog for the for the for for the calculation dialog. So you have to go to the preferences. I'm not sure how to get to that. I don't use his tool enough. Christian is totally right, and I've never messed with that, so we can try live because I know what he's talking about. I just haven't messed with that one. Don't you do it over here? Oh, there we go. Him. And then the minimum font size and formulas right down there. Uh, uh where? Could you, this <laughs> one, is this right, a bit, right, I'm right. thinking this is it right here for formulas, right? Yeah. So uh -huh. you could make it like what 18 or something. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Yeah, try apply. Yeah, try that. Cat, get off there. My cat's about to disconnect the internet here. Better watch out. So yeah, go to. Oh, wow, oh look yeah! Look at that. So sexy. After today's session, and be like, why is my calculation engine so big? Um, that's great. Thank you, Christian. See, just another plug. I I really do like monkey bread. Actually, in fact, you guys will probably notice I have the colorized here. I'm gonna actually, since Christian's here, I want to give a special thank you. This is actually one of my favorite features for the calculation engine and for the script workspace. It is it hands down saves me, especially by turning the variables or uh, things red when you don't have a variable name spelled right. But I had a bug. I think it was last year. And it was screwing up my calculations and I couldn't use it. Um, I reached out to Christian for the first time and I was blown away that I got a response from him quickly. And he said, you know what? I'm aware of the bug. I'll go ahead and get you a release here within the next couple of days that should fix that. So uh, thank you. That was, that was super cool. So uh, back to this. So we've got this let statement. Again, it's in the hide calculation because there's, there's certain locations in which an object can self-evaluate. Uh, if it's a button bar, it's really easy because you have access to the calculation engine in its name, but most objects don't have something like that. So in order to self-evaluate, there's a couple places you can go. I use the hide function and I use the conditional formatting uh, area and I'll show both of those. And so right now what we're doing on, I think it's just a text box, is we're getting its ID we're putting the ID into this function and we're displaying it as a variable on screen. Again, that's a bit of trickery. I don't want to necessarily focus on that specific item, but what it does for us is it lets us see that JSON. So let's see if I can move this over so people can properly see that. So this object right here, it has a name. I'll show that to you. Um, this layout, this is actually the layout name, Though I haven't found these UUIDs actually uh, relate to the to the um, layout itself, and maybe this is just because I'm using it in an undocumented way. But so far, my test, the UUID up here for the layout and the UUID down here for the object always seem to match. But this is the object's persistent, uh, uh, consistent, if you will, ID. And if we go into layout mode and we click on it you can see that that layout has a name called object name text. Okay, let's go back to browse mode. And there it is, object name text. So if everyone's following along so far, we now have some of the tools to get an ID out of an object. And if we can get the ID out of the object, we can find the JSON related to that object. Uh, any questions so far? Are we doing pretty good here? Uh, yeah, I, Stu says it's nice. A lot of people are, are excited by this. Question from Twitch Mailsoft. Ron says, so every layout object in FileMaker will assign an ID to it. So, so, and how would this be important to use? That's a, those are two exceptionally great questions. Uh, so the question is, so let me translate this from Ron speak. It's like, so every object in FileMaker has a UUID in it. Yes, it does. Every object must. And if it hasn't, they've been getting it put in there, so it would have that. And then, the, and the second thing that Ron asks is, why should I care about this? Can you explain why he should care about this, Christian? Yes, and that's, that's exactly what I'd said in the beginning. Most of the people I've showed this to have gone, okay, why does that matter? Like, that's interesting, but why does that matter? Most, and yeah, um, most everyone here ahead. is asking that right now. Uh, Mary Margaret Millick, <laughs> I want to make sure that we answer, you know, because I don't know what level she is. I always assume people, unless I know better, they're like intermediate, mid-level people. So why would an intermediate, mid-level people care about this? Why? I, I think that it is going to be for the regular user of FileMaker. This, this doesn't necessarily matter to them, but it matters to me for a couple reasons. We're going to dive into two use cases here in a moment. But the main one is, I mentioned before, if I reference a script, um, I don't like to reference the script's name. 
because that name could change one day. Correct. Actually, I, I, I would rather reference the script's underlying ID, use the ID to get me the script's current name. It's more reliable. There is an asterisk to that, but we're not going to dive into it. It's, this is especially true for valueless. Um, I used to, I reference valueless all the time in my own techniques and strategies. And I hate, one of the things I like about FileMaker is you can change field names, layout names, table names, everything. So this idea that we get to a certain point and we can't change the text value of a name, uh, I don't like that. And it may seem silly, like who cares? You just leave the valueless thing that is. Well, the human facing names matter. And if how I've used that valueless changes over time, I want that reflected in the name, but I don't want to break a bunch of processes I have. So I refer to valueless by their ID and I can get whatever that current name is. But where I can't do this is if I want to go to an object, if I want to get an object's name for some reason, which may seem a little out there, I'll show you that in a moment, or if I want to refresh an object, I'm fairly restricted in how I can do this. I have to go in here, I have to give the object a text value, a text based name. I need to go to my script workspace and I can do a go to object. And I can type the name in here. And if I ever change the name of the object, that breaks. I can refresh the object, but if I ever change the name of the object, that breaks. But the other spot that this has mattered quite a bit for me is most of you are in here all the time. You watch Nick and you've seen all his tricks. And so you're probably aware of his uh, his button bar with the slide tabs. I, I call it slide tabs. It's, it's one of my favorite features. In fact, I made an add-on from it. And one of the things that frustrated me is that in Nick's naming convention... He's French. It's frustrating. He's hard to understand. Is that what frustrates No, no. Nick's, Nick is actually great. The, the issue is FileMaker, actually. So, oh, I thought it was Nick. <laughs> each, each button has a naming convention, and there's a logic here. Button 1, button 2, button 3. And then you have these slides. Slide 1, slide 2, slide 3. And the way that Nick's thing works is button 1 is related to slide 1, and button 2 is related to slide 2, and so on and so forth. And so what you have to do in the script parameter is you have to say, hey, button one. Or you have to somehow get that, that logic. And is it all that hard in every single button to hard code it? Not necessarily. But for a while now, I've thought, God, if somehow, if this button could just know it's button one, and this one could know it's two, and this one knows that it's three, I could have the same script parameter in all three of them. And any time I add a new button, I can save myself one step. And if I, for some reason, want to change the button naming up here, um, I don't have to go in and fix as many things. Does that does that generally kind of make sense? Yeah, but show it. Explain it, okay. right? Yeah. Like, do you have the two side by side? You can explain and show them and explain them, right? Yeah, so let's, so let's do this real quick. Let's so for those of you wondering about this, this is, this, what, this is on the 19 certification test that they have yet to actually release. And what it's going to force them to do is actually – if they're paying attention, is they have to change some questions on the test because the questions on the test will no longer be valid, right? So I'll get yeah. more to that here in a second, but it's kind of funny. I mean, they're they're so slow in getting the test out, and their and their product management engineers are so fast in doing this agile development thing that uh, the marketing department can't keep up with the engineering department, which I find very funny. Yeah. Um, so here's what we're gonna do real quick. I'm gonna go and click on one of these buttons, and it. To many, this won't look like much. So I want to try to dive into why I think this matters so much. So I'm going to click on invoices. And I have a custom dialogue coming up just to kind of show us what's going on. So it says, hey, I'm button one. And so you go to slide one. I click on this one. It's like, hey, I'm button two. I go to slide two. So again, most people are like, okay, so what, Christian? Like, we've all seen Nick build this. We can all build this ourselves. Why is that so special? So we're going to go into layout mode, and here we're going to look at these script parameters on these, and then we're going to try to unpack it. So on button one, I have a script parameter called get layout object name, quote, quote. And on button two, I've got get layout object name, quote, quote, so on and so forth. If you have seen Nick build this, if you've seen the add-on that I built based on Nick's thing, every single one of these has to be hard-coded text. And so you can't just use the exact same thing each time. What's going on here, and we'll go back and we'll unpack it in just a moment. When I click on this, that button is self-evaluating and it figures out its own name. And then I can use that name to go to the corresponding object. It still has a fragile aspect in that you still have to have names. 
There still has to be a logic, and we're still going to an object by text based name. But let's look at what's going on here. So you'll notice that all of these have conditional formatting on it. Okay. And again, this is part of the reason I don't want people coming out of this stream and immediately implementing this. We are using very much an undocumented process. And there's also some other asterisks, but there's huge potential if Claris expands this feature for us, at least I think. So we're going to go into well, conditional formatting. The only problem is they don't actually know about this live stream. They don't watch it. right? So uh, I did post on their community forum. So if you guys go look up Wolfpaw uh, in there, you guys can upvote that. Uh, I wanted, uh, yeah. Okay, if you I find the link before the end of the day, we'll because what you can do is people submit ideas and you can upvote their ideas. Or if you hate Christian, you can downvote his idea. That would be awesome. So you guys wanna, can downvote. Downvote Christian, yeah. So the idea is that we need things to be. So so let me go back to this. Let me let me frame this a little bit. So this is the test question on the certification test. The test question is. There's kind of a dumb problem, but it's just kind of what Christian's going with this, and that is. Uh, if you, here's a question. How does a button that activate a script, how does, how does a script know what button activated it, right? And when you click on a button, the button technically does not become act, an active object. It's a bizarre kind of situation. You know how like you tab, like if you tab from field, field, tab, tab, tab. As you hit a field, it becomes the active object in focus, right? If you actually click on a button, click on a button, like with a mouse, click on a button, the button will, the script will activate, but the button does not become active. If you tab around the interface and you have, and the bu button happens to be in the tabbed interface and you tab to the button, then the button is the active object. And then if you hit the return key or did something to trigger the button, then, then, then it's the active object. You can say get active object in a get function and you could find out what that was, but normally you can't. So here's the problem in FileMaker. In scripts, th the short version, Christian is very, going round and round and round and very elaborate. But the short version is scripts don't know who the hell called it is the short version. Scripts don't know who called it at all. And because of that, it causes all sorts of problems. You'd like to have these buttons that are dynamic, that are smart. And so we would like to, uh, so when a, when a button calls a script, script should say, hey, what button called me, right? Well, the, 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 in, in the certification test, the answer is you have to hard code it. You have to hard code it or you have to navigate there with your tab key and, and hit the return key, I think, or enter key. And, and of course, now with this technique, there's a more kind of useful way to do it. It's, it's kind of like when you're running code and Christian, we were talking about this with Christian Schmidt when he was on with Monkey Bread, is that like at any given time, I would like to be able to run a git function and find out what line of code my script is at when it's having an issue, like script like I always number my scripts and then I put a name, but I would look at script number 831 on line 421. As I go script three and this script and then on this certain line number. So we're starting to get these kinds of things. That one is still missing, but this is the kind of important stuff that we need. So a script needs to know who called it. It's like, um, you know, it's like it's like it's like if FileMaker built a caller ID and the, and the, and the caller ID is blocked. The button is the caller, caller ID is blocked, and you can't tell who called you, right? It's very frustrating if you have a, uh, if someone like a Christian is, uh, or Kyle or someone is calling you over and over and over, and they're crank calling you like, ha -ha, you're going to die, right? And they hang up. You're like, what an ass? And then they can call you back, and they do they keep doing it over and over and over again. You can't tell who's calling you, right? And so... That's what we need. We need to know who's calling us, right? And that's kind of what this is about. So that is the plain English version, Christian, right? Yes, did I help? No, that, that? that's perfect. That was really succinctly put. And for me, for, just for, to carry for, on for, that. for people like me who are not very bright, I need it dumbed, da dumbed down. Thank you. Sir. Well, and that's, and you know, I'm building add-ons, and I'm really interested in add-ons for myself and whoever I share them with. And a big thing for me is how do I make an add-on that has the least amount of steps for a user to do? both so that I can use them more quickly and efficiently, and two, so that when I share them with people, they're less able to break them. And so the more dynamic components that there are, the, the better these are to me. And uh, an object being able to get its own name is a challenge that has come up for, uh, come is something I've wanted to solve over the years. And this finally lets us do it. Claris just needs to build a little bit more. And I'll get into like, some of the reasons why this might be problematic the way it is right now. Some of you might even be aware of it, but uh, to jump back in, 
on these button bars, each segment has a conditional formatting. And there's a couple ways to solve this. Bilbo asks, hey, why not use the tooltip? Uh, the tooltip is a calculation engine that should be able to self-evaluate on an object, but it, it just didn't consistently work for me. The two places that consistently worked for me were the hide calc and the conditional formatting. But more or less, you're kind of adding unstored calculations. So that's one of the little asterisks. But what I have here is this uh, custom function, get layout object ID, quote, quote. And this is a custom function I wrote that uh, if you put it into one of those self-evaluating places, it uses the layout object UUID function that Claris gave us. I'll show the calculation in a moment. And it basically stores it in a local variable that can be retrieved. Now, if you put quote, quote in, it has a default variable that it uses, but maybe you want to use this in a couple different spots. You could actually put something like uh, uh, button ID and it will create a variable with that name. So I'm gonna cancel this for a moment and I'm gonna show that custom function. It's not very complicated. Okay. Oh, look at that, nice and big because of a uh, monkey bread. All right, so basically again, there's a parameter called var name. If it's empty, I make a layout or I make a uh, variable called layout object ID. Otherwise we use the name that we put in. Then we birth the variable, um, I like that. And we basically attach the UUID to it. And that's more or less what this does, okay? So let's go ahead and grab that text right there. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel. And in fact, we already have it on screen. That's what this is right now. You might have covered over that a little bit. Can you go back to that real quick, Christian? Yeah, 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 absolutely. That. I was, I, we, I, I we, probably people were up fast. voting. Christian Schmidt put the, uh, these other topics to upvote and I was covering over it a little bit. So for those of you who missed this right here. So this is, where is this at again? This is a is this a this is a custom function? I think. Uh, yes, this is a custom function I wrote. Okay. What is this doing? One more time, because I was busy voting, helping. Yeah, abso things. Absolutely. In fact, one of one of Christian's requests, uh, one of our engineers built a custom function that does that. But I'll reply to that later. Um, so what this does is it has a uh, an input where you can name a variable. Think of this as like set variable, and you're giving it the name. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's great. My spelling's awful. Um, if you don't put a parameter, if you don't put a parameter in, it just uses this name. So think of it like this, actually. Okay. Okay. Um, otherwise, you can name your own variable. Uh, this is some flexibility for myself. Maybe I want to name each one, or I just want a default. And we'll talk about why that might matter here in a moment. This down here basically attaches the dollar sign to whatever name we use. Then we get the UUID because we're in the conditional formatting this applies to the the object that has the conditional formatting. So now we have the object's UUID. And then, and this might just be a little complicated to look at, we, we basically create a variable with this name that stores this UUID that can be referenced. That's what this set variable does. Okay, yeah, and I haven't then, seen this demo yet. So this, between the, the conditional formatting triggers this, and this kicks out basically a self-naming variable. Right. Okay, yes. cool. Yes. All right. And so if we, I'm going to go ahead and just cancel. So you just again. have to we, paste this into your solution. You don't have to actually really understand how that works for those of you wondering about that. Yeah. And this, uh, yeah, that's why when you asked if people wanted the demo file, I'm like, I don't know, it's not that special, but if they want my custom function, by all means. So yes. when I click on this button, um, ignore that for a moment, that's its UUID. And if I click right here, it should change. That's its UUID. And, and what we're seeing, let me see if it's still in my, uh, clipboard. Let's clear all this out so we don't confuse people. Da, 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 da. There we go. So there is the UUID. Same mm -hmm. thing. I'll just move this out of the way. Same thing you see over here. Mm -hmm. So I click on that and we're going to have to refresh. Are we already on that one? It might. Oh, there it goes. B6. So that's because we're just using the default value. But let's say I didn't want it to be dollar sign layout object ID. Maybe I'm using this in a couple places. Then what I can do is in the condition. Oops, it really doesn't like that sometimes. Let me quit it again real quick. Would you wait, 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 wait? What's the what, okay? Would you like to explain what problem is the problem here with this? Last night I added a new layout, and for some reason, it like it really pissed off this layout. I I don't know what it was, but I don't want to rebuild the file, so. It, it, it thinks that the layout's being edited, but it's not. 
it's probably because of some sort of hackery in here. Um, but over here, we could we could name it. So instead of using that default variable name, we could name it. Now, the reason this matters is over here in the parameter, we've got another custom function, get layout object name. So let's take a quick look at that. And yeah, we'll which, which is really, at the end of the day, what we need. We don't, the UUID is just, okay, so those of you wondering about this, the UUID is a, a, a means to an end. We actually don't yes. care about it. Yes. So Christian keeps talking. I mean, this is not okay. So go back to browser book. Okay. At the end of the day, I was I was I was wondering why you were doing this. At the end of the day, we don't really care about this. We don't give a we flying want flip. This right here. We want the object name, which is doggy button one or button mm -hmm. whatever it is. And so you so one function gets you this, and then the next function gives you the actual layout object name, and then from that we can target things with the script, etc. Right? Does that make yes. sense? Yes. And that and that's important. So the first time uh, an engineer at RCC showed me that we could get things like script IDs and value list IDs, I remember being like, "Oh, it's so cool!" And then after the the senior meeting, I went and I'm like, "What? Excuse my French. What the hell do I do with this?" Yes. Like, I, like why you is it you can't? It's yeah, not you useful. can't perform script by UUI like by ID. There yeah, is per, no per, go to that. object by UUID that doesn't exist. Correct, go to, run correct. run the script with this UUID. Well, uh, but the UUID allows you to get the current name of that object, yep. which is what we're what, which is what we're interested in. So this other custom function, we'll go ahead and open that up real quick. Okay. Basically, you if you don't put a parameter in, it's going to use the default variable that I use. Or you can say, hey, I named the variable this. So remember... You have the ability to name your own variable or just leave it quote, quote, and it will use the default one. And then we use the new function. I'll go, I'll go put this in the data viewer here in a moment. I'm going to copy that. And it's JSON get element from our new function, and we want the object name. So let, let's go look at what that means. I know some people, Kyle, he's able to read that probably see what it is. Others are like, I'm not so great with the, uh, the JSON. So first, look at this object over here. Granted, this is this object and not the buttons, um, but this is a JSON array. And if we use this UUID, which is what this is, we can get information. Well, back up. Out that's just text, right? All that is is a text string on correct, the screen. Correct, correct. So that's a, okay, back up. For everyone in plain English, that is a block of text, right? Is it yes. a field or is it text text? Uh, this what right now, it? it, uh, it's just it's a text object. It's a text object. Okay, good. Yeah. So we're going to go over here now and we're going to put that function in and we're going to break it down. Name. Um, that's right. I need. Give me one second. There we go. Okay. So let's break this down into two pieces first. First, we're going to look at the new function. The new function, and this is what you guys saw and gal saw off the, the right-hand side. This is this JSON array, okay? By using the new function, get layout object owner info, and by putting the ID in, you can get this JSON object. And we still don't care. This has no value to us. But FileMaker has functions to get the parts out of the JSON that we want, specifically button three. And so what we do is we use our JSON get object and now we can get the button's name. And that's why when we click on this, it knows that it's button three and it knows that it's button two. It is self-evaluating to get its own name and it can now pass its name to a script yes. so that you can use that logic to do something like the so instead of, object. So, that, so now when the script gets called, it knows who's calling it, right? Without exactly. us having to hard code it, it's self-aware. It's kind yes, of self-aware. That's, that's self this button can get its own name. <laughs> this button can, or button segment can get its own name. Objects are able to get their own, own name. name. Now, yes. where Claris could really, really expand this, if they ever watched this video, what we need is to get rid of this hokey conditional formatting with a custom function. And we simply need to be able to go into the script parameter here and put that layout object to UID. This oh okay. so so for the script parameter we put a calculation formula into the script parameter. 
this would be the most idea or most ideal. Yeah, but they would never do that. They they would just make the calc engine available in that parameters. With and that, they, they, there's there's room for uh, there's opportunity for uh, for all of us here. So yeah. that's that's what's that's what's going on there. Okay. Um, I've got one other use case here before I jump to it. Does that does that make sense to everybody? Is there any kind of questions? Well, there's a lot of kind of conversation going back. Stu just asked, Christian, can you clarify which functions you're using that are Claris and which are custom? Yes, I can definitely do that. So I'm going to open up the data viewer here. We're using gonna... two of theirs and one of ours, right? Total mm -hmm. of three. That's exa it, it, exactly. And you don't have to use my custom function. They make it a little easy. So the first you one... must use Christian's function or you will die. Okay, keep going. Okay, so the first one is get layout object uh, owner info. Okay. So this is the first Claris function that they give us. And it's part and for Jake, it's part 19.2.2. If you don't you have- You have to have 19.2. That's probably what Jake asked. When Jake goes, well, I have FileMaker 13.05, can I use it? No. Yeah, and, uh, and Calvin had the same issue. He's like, wait, why can't I find this? So this is, this is brand new. And then in order for this function to work, you have to pass it an ID. So this is the other function they gave us. Oops, it's called layout object. UUID and it has no parameters. You put this into an object to get the UUID. What I'm not even showing people today, if you go to the document documentation page like you should, they give you a, a formula to put it into web viewers and supposedly the web viewer is the only thing that this works for. Um, however, clearly it works for other things. So these are the two Claris ones. And then I use those to do get layout object. So for me, I'm interested in two things. I'm interested in getting the ID, this, and I'm interested in getting the name, this, because I don't care about the JSON array and I don't care about the ID, I want the name. So this gets me the ID, this gets me the name with the ID. So that's why I made two functions because I don't want to sit and have to write get JSON object, uh, object dot name. I just want to plug something in. So these are mine down here and these are the new Claris, um, Claris ones. Okay, real quick. So there's a conversation going on here with Scott King and then Kyle trying to ask answer the question, but Kyle doesn't really have the answer. And I think it's is this it's, about it's, IDs resetting? Yes. And so the yeah. so so the issue is is like, what would cause an ID to reset in FileMaker? So this so, is a oh, go ahead if you want to answer well, it. Well, let me start off. Let me frame this a little bit. So let me let's understand how. For those of us who lack sympathy to Claris a little bit, so this is kind of what they're up against. I don't even know if their marketing and sales teams and management even understand this, but I do. So here's the rub. Claris has historically had a proprietary database engine. We all know about this. In the database engine, it internally knows the names and IDs of things. It didn't really ever use a UID, okay? Um, but Claris, back in 16, uh, they started playing with these add-ons and they, before Christian could ever build an add-on, and I'm not looking, there's like this frothing conversation, I'm having a conversation with you. Um, they never had add-ons. That was why people say, we need a diagnostic tool that can take FileMaker apart and it can find the corruption, do all this. And Claris kept saying, the infrastructure under the hood doesn't even exist for that, right? For example, we need instructions, instruction manual to open up the hood of the car and to change the spark plugs, except that there's a hundred wires or a thousand wires under the hood and none of them are labeled. Um, Claris can tell what they are because they're brilliant and they know this, but they're not labeled in a way that anyone can actually see. So what Claris has had to do over the last four or five releases is to start put UUIDs into the product under the hood so they can identify stuff because they can't let us monkey with the structure unless we can name and identify the structure and the only modern way of naming and identifying anything is with a uuid right so they had to put uuids in before they could do all this other stuff right every last stinking item in the product has to have a uuid every field every script every every line of a script probably has to have a uuid i would guess i, I don't know that but every like every account every username and password every value list every 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 relationship every to every connection across uh probably from uh, from one to to another to that connection probably has to have a uuid so they had to go in and renumber a name under the hood even if we're completely oblivious to it it's the same old file maker they've had to do this it's a huge undertaking for them to do this it's why 
slowly but surely the add-ons are coming on and then they turn on and then they add little new features and this starts to work so that's kind of the historic struggle because back when they first engineered built this engine back in 2000 whatever about 2000 2001 whenever they did that we didn't need this didn't it wasn't needed right because if you wanted this kind of flexibility you had to go to sql or something right some other system right because filemaker was not supposed to be that crazily amazingly awesome right so anyway <clears throat> huge conversation going on here but yeah but 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 what happened is is that they so i'm not mad at him about in fact of all the things that claire says is frustrating this doesn't bother me this is just organic growth of the platform the pl pro the platform continues to grow um i get mad about things that are like obviously just dumb and they understand that this is one where we kind of painted ourselves we a couple weeks ago or a week ago we did a paint ourselves in the corner they literally painted themselves into a corner now they're like doing spider-man they're crawling on the wall around the side of the room trying to get away from the corner they painted and it's kind of a bitch right and so a lot of hard work a lot of effort and they're slowly doing it and this is the stuff that you're starting to see they're, the objects under the hood are named now if you went back to this file in filemaker 16 i doubt that object is named it's not there even if you could get this function to run it's not named now if you open the file in filemaker 19.2.2 then suddenly that object has a name where did that object name come from i don't know magical secret stuff we'll have to ask clay mackle about when did that object name get give birth and all that so so now that we understand a file has all these names the question is are ids all the id numbers how and when can they be reset that's a whole separate conversation okay a very 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 separate conversation but it's also important for Claire's to control and not just willy-nilly renumber things right like if you had a solution and you save a compressed copy of the solution or you duplicate the file and, it, and FileMaker goes oh I'm just gonna zap all the numbers and redo them that would be really bad that would be really really bad right so um they they're obviously they're, there's a conversation about when one file trusts another file ear encryption at rest is the same thing each of the files has a uuid and that's how it knows who to trust the file access permissions when you have multi multi-file solution that trusts each other each of those files knows the secret id the uuid guess what it's a uuid and it shares that with those files so if you reset the permissions that UUID is reset. It doesn't reset all the IDs in the file. It just does the secret, like the secret Mickey Mouse handshake, uh, Mickey Mouse Club. Like you have the secret handshake, you know, you know, kind of thing, right? I, I think it does reset all the IDs. It? Are you sure? It resets all so, the ideas? Uh, okay, back up. I, I, Let's go to that. Go to that file. Be careful with this because this is dangerous. File. Well, that's why I wanted to tell. I I use internal IDs, but like security. Ron, if he's listening, I had a conversation with him about security. this. Go to security because then... there's a there's a definitely a catch on this. Advanced. It... Yeah, and it's the uh, file. This one right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Only also, so, and then it's the reset all right here. Yeah, it's so. gonna it resets the trust between the files, but all the internal IDs. Are you sure You're, you want to reset the unique ID of this file? Resetting the unique ID is useful, but I can't say for a hundred percent if this does reset all the IDs. But what I can tell people definitively is that let me turn off this. Clearly, we had an hour. Well, well it if would take you, you long. You build the file, you you do your button, and, and then so the, run it. Yeah. So so we, we can test it right now in just a moment and see if you. Uh, 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 I have a file that I used to share with a lot of the internal staff when they would come on board and I had an issue. I reference everything by its internal IDs. And so I would get Jacob to pull a copy of that file off of the server. I'd put the copy of the file on my desktop. I'd right click on it and I would duplicate the file. Yes. The moment you do that, all the internal IDs reserialize. All wait, wait, back up. So what? What all the buttons and everything, or the trust Script permissions? ID, value, value list IDs, table IDs, field IDs, all the underlying IDs. Not not contact ID, obviously. Not the no, ones no, that no, 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 no. I'm talking about the I, you, you, all the structural object IDs. They they re serialized. 
And that's when you duplicate it and put it on your. Uh, if you if you pull it off of the server and uh -huh. you like uh, compress the file and reopen the zip a hundred times, you're fine. You have to. Uh, let me close this. Why don't you do it? I will. Let's see. Let's make a note. Write this down. Like have a button and write it yeah, down. Yeah. So if but, you if you book this file, let me actually open one of these. Because this is for those of you wondering what senior developers worry about these days. This is the kind of stuff we worry about. So right? if you if you take this file and you right click on it and you duplicate it, the duplicate will have different UUIDs okay, for on, the internal structure than. The, uh, okay, stop, stop, stop. Do, don't mm -hmm. duplicate while it's running. Let's make a note, write that number down or paste it or whatever. So we have well, it's a number. separate file, so we can just do it on that file and not have an issue. You want me to do that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, but I mean, we need to be able to open, yeah, and then. So let me let me get a custom function out of one of my databases real quick. Oh, where'd it go? There it oh, is. I'll let you, yeah, because this it. is, this is, frankly, this is the stuff that Claris is wrestling with, um, and it has to be handled perfectly. And and you can't have things and, and resetting I'm, themselves. I'm, and I'm fairly certain that we can test it that that security option also resets all the internal IDs. Well, it now, would definitely reset the trust ID. I think. Well, we can test here, and this is. But here's the thing. So people are like, oh shoot, so you can't use the internal IDs. Stop for a moment and think about this. How are most people using their files, or should they be using their files? It should be on FileMaker's server. Right. Are you ever taking your file down from the server? and right clicking on it to duplicate it and put it back on. I mean, if, if well, that's a business practice, well, even if you don't did though, IDs. most people aren't hard coding to those IDs, right? So it's so not most really... people would not have that issue. But so that's a rule when I develop but, like, Hey, I need to know ahead of time. There's not any, and you can still get copies of the file because you could pull backups off of the server all day long and they'll all have the correct. Okay, let me back up here. Let me help with something really, really important. So here's the thing. All this is leading towards the ability to patch, take a file and patch it. And we patch it by targeting the areas that we want to patch. If you save a copy of the file and the IDs change, you can never patch it because the, the sh 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 your targeting would always change. It's like if, you came, if I came home and my wife's name changed every day, oh, today she's Sally, tomorrow she's Tracy, you know, Sally, she's... Uh, Mufi, her last name is Mufi, right? Our first name is Mufi. I talk about how hard it would be to like manage that if if things change all the time. I would be if this changes, they're in deep trouble because I don't know how they're ever going to patch the application. Because if the IDs are always changing, like, hey, I built this patch for for the customer. Oh, the customer took it off the server and saved a copy of their computer. Oh, the patch won't work anymore. You're all screwed. That's the thing, right? So it's. Uh, I would be shocked if they're doing that. Because then that means this whole conversation about patching is poof. Again, yeah. though, are people taking a file off the server and clicking duplicate on it? Because at that point, you have a different file. Maybe it should have different UUIDs. Well, then, but okay, but then you can't patch. You, you have a. You, yeah, pfft, yeah, I don't know how you'd ever. Okay, so I build up. Okay, so I am the Vet FM people in Sacramento. We do vet software. They sell the software to 20 companies. They're going to build a patch that can fix all those customers has a bug in their script, and they're going to run the patch. There's no way they could ever do it if it's resetting itself after every copy is made. The, sure. only, the only way it, should, it would reset, I would think, structurally, it should never reset. The record should reset, but I don't know that the, the structure. So are you... Where are we at here with your test? So I'm trying, I don't know if this file is just so simple, it's not doing it, because I've absolutely broken files that method. Um, I don't know if there's just because there's so so little in these, it does have the same underlying IDs. It should. Or or they've changed this since I last. Well, I that last could be that. too. Listen, remember, remember, when we start patching stuff, they're not going to go back and let you patch FileMaker 15, right? The, the, the underlying infrastructure isn't there. Right. So, yeah, maybe yeah. the IDs did uh, break previously. Right. You know, that wouldn't surprise me. But yeah. So I don't know if this file is just so simple that the IDs are in the same sequence that they are. But I absolutely absolutely. It's this file right here. I used to take this off the server mm -hmm. and give the new juniors a copy. Okay, of this so, file. so save a compressed copy of it. Save a compressed. Copy. I can't. It's it's I'd have to go talk. To oh, them. you have to go pull it yeah. off the server. OK. Yeah. I mean, we could try it maybe on Launchpad, but I do want to at least get to the last part of this. Well, it's um, very, but this is such a, this is really kind of a big deal. And if you're an advanced developer, it's, it's like, And well, then let's, let's try this. I'm curious um, what we're going to go in here. Let's do the security one that you're talking about. Um, well, that, that would, uh, it should reset the files ID, but so not all the internal guts. Let's, Once again. Let's see. That's, I think it's a, it's a, I'm really interested actually knowing the answer there. 
Yeah, I'd be so stunned. So we've got 10, means... 6, 5, 8, 9. That didn't. So that's the table ID. Interesting. So maybe maybe they've changed this since 19, which would be great. This was always one issue, uh, even though, like I said, it's kind of an edge case. So I don't know right now if it's just because this file has so little in it. Nah, or that wouldn't be it's... it. It's going to be a function of either they changed it with the version number or something else. The only time you're going to change a structure would be potentially – even a recover. Listen, think about it. If you're building solutions in your vet FM and you're a vertical market solution provider and you want to patch all these files, you have to have a, I, a oh, definitive. I don't, I don't disagree line. with your logic. I just know what I experienced. Oh, I know. Well, actually, and if you experienced it with anything prior to 19, it wouldn't surprise me. Because remember, this yeah, has all been super. This has all been a super. Well, listen, it's here. not even officially official yet in terms of being able to do this patchy stuff, right? They talk about it, but. Yeah, so why is it not even giving me a oh because I don't have the function one second I gotta steal the function and put it in here and then I do have one more uh, use case of where the oh, listen, that's the wrong one where this is useful and also something that I'm I think there's some potential um, why am I there we go my brain wasn't working for a moment so we're gonna copy that we're gonna come over to our two copies of launchpad we're gonna paste this in because Launchpad has a lot more going on. So. Well, well, cloning, yeah. So Monkey's talking about cloning the file, so. Cloning is fine. Yeah, well, cl well cloning actually should, will reset some things. I, I would be, if you had a customer that cloned the file, it shouldn't restretch, reset structural things, but all the record tracking in it should be reset. For example, record IDs, there's this record ID. Long before there was ever UID, there's a hidden record ID, right? And if you save a copy or recover whatever, say you delete, you have 10,000 contact records, you delete them all, you start putting new records in, the records are going to start at 10,001, right? 10,002. The only way to reset that is to do a clone, and it resets that counter back to zero, right? So, yeah, Twa says the low code environment. So and that I shot a video about this the other day. So the FileMaker platform is low code, but it also gives you options to digging into pro code or professional code level stuff if you need to go that far, right? So I think if you had a, an application that was low code only, you'd be screwed. Any great application, I like why we like this platform. It does low code, but if you want to dig deep, then there's you know, pro level code. And that's kind of what today's conversation is about. I mean, poor Mary Margaret Millick, I guarantee she probably wasn't hoping for this today. She was hoping yeah. for something probably a little more savory. But well, uh, we can get back on topic again here. But uh, this is interesting, at least at least to me, that um, unlike previous experiences, it's not resetting the IDs. Yeah. Well, it, no, you very well could have, but understand that um, um, I'm getting it's, weird a, it's a product in that uh, it would never. It would never be a product that you could patch then, right? So it's so. Here's the thing: we talk about this patching stuff, and 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 and, and just for the record, since I haven't been briefed on this and I don't know anything, then I can speculate till the cows come home. But Claris has to rename or renumber their product in May, about in May or sometime May, Juneish timeframe. Uh, otherwise, people are going to be getting free software that Claris hates to give them free software that should have bought updates for. So at some point in the future, 19 won't be a thing anymore. Um, it'll be whatever. Um, and uh, the other part of that to understand is that uh, is that this patching and coding and thing, it, I don't think it'll be ready for prime time until at least probably whatever 21 or 22 would be at the, way, at the rate they're going. It's getting better, but these are incremental adjustments and fixes. They're not like we're close to having a patchable kind of thing. Right. I mean, I don't know if Christian uh, Schmidt's here. He's probably wandered off and it's pretty late where he's at. But I mean, I very late there. The, the reality is how close are they to, to being able to really have a UUID that's accessible for every object? Well, so the, and this so outside of what I'm showing everybody here again, the reason they even invented this is in the conversation that's going on that I can't share everything on um, is how do we improve the add-on process for developers. And one of the things that's missing right now is this persistent ID of, of an add-on. And so the conversation I've been having with Claris there is if I make an add-on and dump it into uh, uh, three or four different files, it would be wonderful. And Claris sees the need here to be able to know that add-on 
by some unique identifier and then to be able to get information about that add-on. The idea with this whole get loud object owner information is that the peop those of us making add-ons can actually maybe encode some sort of data that gets passed to all of these target files. But like you said, none of it necessarily exists right now. We're, they and we're all trying to figure out what does that look like? Uh, and, and actually, this was one of my last items, but I'll bring it up now because it's actually uh, pertinent, is this idea that, that objects are storing JSON information. Um, it's not something I've been asking or thinking about, but it poses an interesting uh, question to us. Could it be useful to store some sort of data into objects? I mean, this is kind of wacky because it's not now, a table. Absolutely. It's it would not be a your, script. It would be your Go own ahead. hidden internal uh, structural information on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And for me, this is really useful because in the add-on world, I have add-ons with no tables. They're, they're object-oriented, slide tabs, the accordion. And it would be useful to be able to, in that payload object, encode certain information and if i had a unique identifier i could make it where no matter what file you drop the add on it, it could use that unique identifier to to add to get to get logic to get data and i think that there's a huge potential here and that's and this is again this is just scratching the surface and then outside of add-ons I, I don't know that claris realized that uh, uh, that there is huge potential to people who have no interest in add-ons whatsoever to be able to get that uh, that current name of, of an object. Um, it would be one of the last fragile places that we that we have in FileMaker. Yeah. So Amoki was asking questions about you know where does this go in terms of so once again a little bit on this. So so Claris has been wanting to this patching idea and they did the add-ons and they were super successful. Everyone's on board. Everyone here has loved it pretty much. Even if you don't know how to build add-ons, even if like I don't really particularly care to build add-ons anymore. Mostly I manage and I and I evaluate and I help guide people, right? What I do. Um, so for me, it's like, I don't really want to build them, but I'd like to use cool ones. That's the majority position on it. Well, how, how, so, so, so add-ons are great, but add-ons are a subset. Once again, we talked about the serialization of the code. If the code can be rendered out completely as an XML file, more or less, or JSON, et cetera, et cetera, some sort of organized format, then you can specifically identify, you can take a FileMaker file, export as text, go into a text editor, change it, or run some sort of app that changes it, then recompile it. It's the Star Trek, we're talking about the Star Trek transporter. You zap something, it turns it into atoms, you beam it, you change it, you alter it, alter it, and then you rematerialize it. So the add-ons are the ability to basically take an arm or a leg or an ear or something like that and to uh, render it down and then attach it to another FileMaker file. So I said, once again, I was talking to Jesse Barnum, I said if it wanted an extra hand sticking out of the top of your head, a third arm, uh, FileMaker can kind of do that right now. That's what add-ons are, okay? But the idea of dematerializing the entire body which have to have UUIDs for everything because we have to identify every molecule. That's the whole point. You have to identify all the pieces. You have to have a UUID for each one. We have to be able to get to the UUID for each one. Once they have that figured out, then you could do the whole file. It's like trying to beam a whole person. Right now, if you beam the whole person, it kills them. They can't do it. They can beam an arm or a leg or an ear or an eye, right? Makes sense, Moki? So um, it keeps getting better, keeps getting better but it's not like really ready for the complete versioning conversation yet. Right. Christian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm so trying, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I take it backwards, but I'm trying to make sure that the people who are not quite Kyle are, and my, you know, myself, right. Or. Oh yeah. yeah. What's this going is on. definitely, like I said, the more deep end of the pool. If, if you don't know how you would use what I'm showing off today, I don't think it's going to disrupt your ability to make quality good apps, but um, if you do know what it is, I think that there, you know, there's a reason Kyle, myself, Calvin, and you know Richard are very excited of what's here. There, there's a lot of potential to it. So I got two other things. I know we're a little bit over time. Now let's keep going. It's fine because uh, the idea of having these things reset to me was a very dangerous idea. So I, it's, it's I'm a, really intrigued. But I'm really actually happy that they don't reset. Well, that, you might want to pitch that out with the people you're talking to. I'll just leave it loosely like that since I'm not in that conversation. But if you want to pitch that out to them and say, hey. Uh, I also just learned something while we're chatting here that I'll, I'll share last that's really interesting. So okay. first, I want to show the last part of the demo. 
Okay. Which is, okay, so this one is an object can self-evaluate to get its name. Yep. That can be useful to do stuff, to yep. put it generically. That's what yep. we've been doing today. Perfect. So now what we're going to do is, well, what's the other part of it? This part is actually a little bit more rock solid, which is I can go to or refresh an object by ID. Really? So what does that mean? Yeah, so right now I'm using the same slide panel, but let's say for some reason, because this is where I've always wanted this, you have a script that says, hey, go to object or refresh object, and you got it, you got to put it in text. And then for some reason, you change that object's name in the future, um, it, it will break. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to slide two. And what I'm doing in this case is, is different than the other one. Okay. So I've got, I'll show you guys the script, but it's nothing all that fancy. But I have a script parameter here that says go or, or get layout object name, and I'm putting the UID in. So if you remember that custom function I showed you, it is using a variable, and all the variable stores an ID. So in this case, I'm hard coding it. And I'm like, hey, give me this object's name. Let me show you that in the data viewer, okay? And first of all, let me show you this one. So this object is called slide two. So I'm gonna go to browse. I'm gonna open up the data viewer. Okay, and it says slide two. So if you put the UUID in here, um, it uses the new Claris custom function and a JSON get object, and you can get that object's name. So watch this. So that says slide two. I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna go into layout mode. I'm gonna go to slide two, and I'm gonna change it. And I'm just gonna call it dynamic. Actually, we'll call it kitty cat. Fit cat, even better. We'll hit refresh. Oh, you're not going to come on now. Ugh, I did something wrong there. Well, nothing like having a break. Um, let me pull it. I was talking to uh, Russell here. So, Russell, the lights came on in Russell's head. He gets it, which is awesome. So, that's perfect. That's the goal with what we're trying to do here. So, Russell goes, so he goes, so someday. If I have a customer with a solution, I can send them a new layout and it could patch their solution. I go, yes. Or you could uh, send them a new version of a layout they already have because their layout is ugly or it's got a bug or something's wrong with it, right? Yeah. Um, but in order to send the new layout to them, you'd have to know the ID of the layout you're going to replace, which means the layout number can't really change, right? So there you go. So that's where this goes, right? Yeah. So, so for some reason, I don't know why the other demo is being finicky with right now, but I have in this demo, I, I have a single step. That's not even a script. So you guys can see all of kind of the pieces here. Go to object. Now, again, you can't go to object by ID. You have to go to name. So in this case, we evaluate in this single step, get layout object name, and I have the ID. Okay. And so if I go here to browse and I click on go, it takes me to the second slide. And if I go to that second slide, and I change the name. So we're going to call this uh, cat. Button doesn't break. I can infinitely change the name of this and not break it. So it just, this might not look like much to people, but this hardens your code. It makes things less fragile and less likely to break. And so we're doing a go-to object. But, and again, this is what Richard said is so good. We don't actually care about the ID. What we care is that that ID lets us get the current name. And I've got something for Stu in a moment, but did you want to jump in at all there? No, no, no. I think there was a conversation. So Ruben's going, yeah, so you could kind of do this already, but it was a lot of coding and a lot of, yeah, I mean, I think it was more fragile. I think, I think now you can drag and drop things without having to do actually coding at all. And they can be, they're lo loosely self-aware. That, especially if you're using uh, something, something for Russell to know. Um, according to another member in the community, um, these UUIDs are not the UUIDs from the XML. So I see him saying, "Oh, you could get the XML out of the file," and you, no, they actually don't match. Um, I don't really? know if that. No, so you're saying to... you're saying that the DDR, the version one of the, of the report, which is, if you go to now, go back to file, maybe you go to tools. Where'd I go? Click on that. Yeah, and tools, then, data. Uh, uh, not, yeah, yeah, yeah not, not, okay, so everyone stop, freeze. This is version two. This is the prototype. This is the prototype 
for the transporter that kills everyone right now. Like remember I said we can't transport a whole body because it kills you, but you can this is builds add-ons. Remember an add-on is an arm or a leg or something like that. This is that, okay? This right here contains version one of the transporter, which lacks fidelity. It's the one we've had for a long time. It's the one that base elements uses to analyze your solution, determine where you have unused scripts, things like that. So at some point, these two things somehow will, you know, have to be consolidated or reconciled or something. So you're saying that the XML, the UUID between here and here is uh, not the same. According to one of the partners who responded to my post, that's correct. They don't match. Um, now, in terms of what Russell's asking for, I think this whole, there's there's three things that they came out with 19 that were really huge. One of them was actually before. One is the data migration tool. The other one is add-ons. And the other one, and correct me on the terminology here, it's it's that version updating tool that like builds the code into it. So you could like, I think that's the patching you've been referring to. Yeah. That would allow you to do what Russell's kind of indicating I'm yeah. the least familiar with that one right now. Well, and, and there's um, no, but they're, they're and all there's, interconnected. And there's no documentation on it. And according to the product management team, they can't do a whole file yet. So it's we're back to this kind of hacky kind of existence. So I listen, Claris's effort is all going into add-ons. Once they master add-ons, all that tech is being recycled. It's like if they're, they're they're working on the transporter to really finalize it so it works really, really easy and great on arms and eyes and I need an extra ear or or Moki or, or, or Kyle wants a, a, a longer appendage wherever makes them happy, right? Um, this thing does that, but they take in that technology and that's what allow you to beam a whole person, move Richard from point A to point B. Not only could you move Richard from point A to point B, you could actually copy Richard from point A to point B and it would be a perfect copy, which could be really scary because two of me is very dangerous, right? So yes, yeah, it's the, um, to be able to, kick out the XML is the what they call the serialization of the code is what Claris calls serialization of the code. It's a rendering of the code at its most at, at the at the most highest fidelity, perfect fidelity is the words I like to use in the book and, and in videos. And if you have perfect fidelity, then you can reverse the process and it reconstructs the FileMaker file from that code, right? From the text, right? And then you have a functional FMP12 file, right? Makes sense? So that's kind of this, it's it's a major concept. We talk about it in the book, we talk about it here. I know for a lot of people, it's like, whoa, right? We're at the beginning of this. Literally, we're just experimenting, but we're in a platform where the, where the company sees this as being a major a major piece for them, a major piece of success, right? So it's they got a lot of enthusiasm. All of us are, even people here who really, this is like above their pay grade. And they really don't care. Kind of interested because they can see anyone who's a business person sees that. Oh, if I can take my have my FileMaker transporter and beam body parts from left and right and combine and do this, or I can patch like Ron at Mailsoft makes a product and gives it to a hundred people, a thousand people, and then he makes one little patch thing and he goes and then he uses like 360 works and their deploy tool. And deploy tool uses this new stuff in here that you see this stuff in here. And he press a button and then it runs that update. It doesn't give them a new file. It takes a little bit of code and it fixes each file all over the world. And then Ron's like getting this giant checks, cash, bundles of money are coming to Ron. And then Ron is so thrilled. That's where this goes. It makes making vertical market applications much easier. And some people can make good money doing vertical market applications. So if you like Christian, listen to the code. If you do it correctly and you have a good idea and you work your ass off, then you get this. Okay? Questions? I got, uh, if there's questions, let me know. Otherwise, I got one last thing that, um, thanks to Stu, I kind of discovered live while we were doing this. It's kind of interesting. Uh, any questions there, though? I got a little distracted myself. Uh, you asking me? I was just having my my little speech okay. moment. So, I'm good. I'm good. So yeah, no, I no. Think... So la the last thing I got here. So Stu asked, um, "What is the? If you look at the JSON uh, object, there are other parts in here that we haven't even talked about, like the index. And again, there's also this layout ID that I just don't think is actually working right now. Um, but it made me wonder, and this is actually something I've thought about. I, I don't know why I didn't experiment with it before today. But what happens if you take a layout object and duplicate it? Does it get a new UUID? And so I did that. I took a button bar and it, I duplicated it, it and it has It doesn't have a new UUID? It's the same UUID. See, that's broke because you No, can't... hang on, hang on, hang on. I don't think it is. And but this is where it's maybe gonna get more complicated. Um 
if you take that same object and you duplicate it to another layout, I thought it would have the same ID. It doesn't. That, in my opinion, it should for add-ons, not necessarily regular development. So then what I did is I took this one that displays the attributes and I duplicated it. And what you'll notice, actually, you know what? It does have a different UUID in this case and also a different index number. So never mind. In this case, it did do something All right, the totally short different. version, we have no idea what we're doing. You should yeah, definitely so, so not Stuart listen asked, to us. What is this index number? And my answer was, at this point, I don't know. So this is, I'm still learning what this all does right now. But the two use cases are self-evaluate, get name, go to, and refresh. But the potential here is huge. Well, once again, all this, they said, Claire said this only works in web viewers, right? Remember that whole conversation? Yes, yes. And of course, it, and so clearly they covered, Claire's covered themselves like, because if we find something that doesn't work or the way they expect it to work, they're going to say, well, we only certify this to work on web viewers, right? So they've covered themselves by saying that if you kill yourself and your neighbor and their favorite dog, it's your fault, not their fault, right? So. It, exactly, exactly. So, you know, if this is something that people like, go let them know go let them know i don't think that claris didn't want to help us i think that they they solved one or they're helping solve one problem you know what the analogy i gave a lot of people is it reminds me of when they were first going to space and they invented a bunch of stuff like duct tape and fire retardant suits and they tang. weren't and tang and tang they weren't trying to invent duct tape that we all use in our homes they had a they had a real problem that they had to solve and they invented something that solved that problem and I don't know the exact history on it, but somebody probably went, wow, this is far more powerful than just the one use case we use it for, fire retardant suits. And so I think that, you know, Claris solved a specific issue for us. Mm -hmm. And in so doing, they've given us, you know, duct tape. Yeah, there we go. So we have duct tape. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, Simon Day, I don't, yeah, I just, yeah, no. There we go. So, yeah, I'm going to stop right now because we're over time and because Simon yeah. Day wants to discuss the concept of comparing Claris to NASA. I, in some ways, in terms of bureaucracy and stuff, that may not be a bad comparison, right? You know, it's like, you know, if you got an astronaut who actually, because I'm pretty sure the astronauts who actually fly the shuttles and the rockets and stuff are not in charge. <laughs> so it's uh, whatever that means. Land this plane, Carol. Land it right now. That's, uh, oh, I thought it was, Ellen was back. Okay, great. So we're now landing. So tomorrow's broadcast, we'll be talking about uh, performance stuff. So we're going to go from like crazy great. So all of you high IQ people can just cut out tomorrow because you should already know all this. You should have it memorized like the back of your hand. You should have it all memorized, right? And then uh, Wednesday and Thursday will be Anchor Buoy. So if you don't understand Anchor Buoy, you're not an expert at Anchor Buoy, bring your questions on that because people are like, why do I do anchor buoy and why can't I do it this other way, right? Because I have some visual visual aids to help you with that, okay? You understand, right? It's actually quite simple. And if you think I'm making it up, then we could talk about Hans's performance uh, information on that. And if you don't believe that, then we could also check out Claris's uh, engineering blog, which will endorse what I am saying tomorrow. Not by name, though. They're not going to say Richard Crow did his us and you should listen to him. Although they probably should. It would be probably useful for them to do that. And then it would help straighten people out. Okay, cool. All right, Christian, anything else when you're smiling little face and down there with your uh, glitter and everything? <laughs> the, the glitter, the pets, everything's, everything's good over here in San Luis Obispo. <laughs> All right, cool. I right, appreciate everyone. We'll catch you tomorrow. I'll see you.
and the guys just stepped up the whole way. Calm, cool, collected the quarterback. Great read, good patience. More importantly, great job up front protecting this quarterback to give you a chance. And that's all you can ask for. Trying to rally down 10. 9.25 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot, goes Stands in, throws it left for Amendola. Reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Rolling to the 9. Ball slightly behind him, but Danny makes the grab.